was Jesus. And in time, in times past, you did speak to us by the fathers, but in these last days, you've spoken unto us by your Son. May you be lifted up. May your Son be lifted up today, not only in our voices through singing, but in the proclamation and in the hearing of your word today. We love you and thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. What an appropriate set of songs we've sung. Uh, We have been defended by our country and by its uh, military, and Jesus is also our defender. (laughs) And there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that's what we're going to talk today about. We're in a series we started last week that's going to take the better part of a year, I believe. So hold on, hang on, keep coming as we walk through and travel through the book of Hebrews. If you have your Bibles, we're in Hebrews chapter number one. And I've entitled at least this part of the series in Hebrews with this title, Jesus is Greater. Jesus is Greater. And that is exactly the message of the series. It's the message of the book of Hebrews. And it is really the point of this particular sermon. So I'm excited to give it to you today. Last week, we spent most of our time in verses 1 and 2, and I told you that verses 1 through 4 are really one sentence in the original language. That sentence is driven by two clauses, God spake and God, what? Hath spoken. Say that with me. God spake, God hath spoken. And that really is the the verses that we're reading Hebrews chapter 1, let's just look at them again, and we're going to walk through this almost phrase by phrase today. It's going to be a blast. Here's what it says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Who is the son of God? Jesus. That's exactly right. Whom he hath appointed heir of all things. By whom also he made the world, whom being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. The author of Hebrews spoke about two times that God spoke in times past and in these last days. In times past, he spoke unto the fathers by the prophets. It was fragmented. It was partial. It was progressive in its revelation. It went from incomplete to complete. It didn't go from less true to more true. It's all true. It went from incomplete to complete. In these last days, He has spoken unto us by his Son. This is God's complete revelation. And what you see in this very first part of the very first sentences are key to the theme of the book. God wants us to know that Jesus Christ is superior in every way. If you're offended by us talking about Jesus, you're not going to like this series. Because the point of this series is Jesus is greater. Jesus is better. Jesus is superior in every single way. Thirteen times in the, in the book of Hebrews, the word better is used. We'll talk about the angels and why Jesus is better than the angels. He'll say in these verses that Jesus outranks the angels. He will also say in the rest of these verses in Hebrews 1 that Jesus Christ outlasts creation itself. In these first three verses that Jesus outspeaks not only creation, he outspeaks the prophets. They were God's partial word. When God spoke in his son, the Lord Jesus, that is God's final word. God's full, final, complete message to mankind is found in the person of his dear son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm here to preach Jesus to you today. That's why we're here. We'll see in the remaining part of this sentence and really the entirety of the study of the book of Hebrews, again, that Jesus is superior in every way. And I want you to hear this. The most important thing about you 
the most important critical thing about you is what you think about when you think about Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. The most important thing about you is what you think about when you think about Jesus. It's crucial that you think rightly about Jesus. He is superior literally to everything in the universe. So here's my sermon in a sentence. Jesus can be known. You can know Jesus is greater by understanding and believing seven magnificent statements found about Jesus Christ in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 uh, that we're going to look at today. Now, let's look at the first term that describes Jesus Christ, and I hope that you internalize these yourself. Okay, this is so cool. Are you ready? You don't seem ready. Are you ready? Come on. Here we go. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he, God, hath appointed, Jesus, heir of all things. So the first thing that he is, the first term that we're going to see to show that Jesus is greater, is that he is an heir. This is not the only place where Jesus is referred to as an heir. What's an heir? Someone who receives an inheritance. Anybody here ever been an heir or will be an heir in some way? Okay, there's a few of you. I've got some property in Texas that's going to come to me at some point because I am an heir. I'm an heir. Are you an heir? I want you to know that if you're in Christ, you're all heirs. We're going to talk about that in a second. It's all over the scriptures that Jesus himself is referred to as an heir. In Mark chapter 11, a bunch of scribes come to Jesus when he was in the temple, and they ask him what authority he has. He's in there, and he's teaching, he's ministering, and they come up to him like, Who, whose authority do you speak on? And this leads to Jesus telling them the parable of the tenants. So if you have your Bible, I'll put the verses on the screen, but if you want to read along with me, put that ribbon. Anybody got a ribbon in your Bible? Or if you're looking on an app, there's probably some way you can bookmark it. Go over to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. In Mark 11, they're asking him about whose authority do you come under. They, he goes into a story starting in Mark chapter 12 as part of his response to them. Look at what he says. Mark chapter 12, verse 1. And he began to speak unto them by parables. A certain man planted a vineyard and set a hedge about it and digged a place for the wine fat and built a tower and let it out to the to and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. So you have the guy who does all of the work, he purchases the land, he builds a vineyard, he builds the field, and then he it says here, and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen. That's the old way of saying he rented it out to them. Right? What song was that? Rooms for let? I don't know. I probably shouldn't bring up songs. I don't know. Okay, so, Rubes, anyway. King of the road. Yeah, that's what it was. All right. ADD. Okay. The lead is the renting it out. So he hit, lent it out to vineyard people, to, to husbandmen. Verse 2, and at the season he went to the husband, at husband, he sent to the husbandman a servant that he might receive from the husband of the fruit of the vineyard. Time to collect rent. Time to collect the payment on your using my vineyard. Verse 3, and they caught him and what? Beat him and sent him away empty. So the husbandman keeps sending servants to the tenants. They keep beating them and sending them away. Now, in any parable that you read, one of the things you have to do to interpret is, who are all these people? Who does it apply to? The person who owns the vineyard is God. The husbandmen are mankind, and God keeps sending his messengers to mankind. This would be the prophets. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in times past unto the prophets. Do you get it? Okay. And what are the people doing with the, with the prophets? They're beating them. Is that not what happened with some of the prophets? Yeah. Verse 6, having yet therefore one son. Who's the son? You got it. His well-beloved. How many sons did he have? One. Were they like the prophets? 
Were they like the other guys coming? No. They're sent by the Father. They're sent by the owner. But here he comes. He sent himself, him also last unto them, saying, they will reverence my son. What's his reasoning? Okay, if they keep beating the prophets, maybe they'll reverence my son. Verse 7, but those husbandmen said among themselves, this is the, do you see it? Heir. Come, let us, what? And the inheritance shall be ours. Now think about how stupid that is. You know you can get on, like if you're nice enough to people and you're kind enough to people, you become like family even if you're not family. And there may be, have you, has anybody ever heard of somebody getting on somebody's will even though they weren't family? Has, has anybody ever heard that? Okay. If you kill my kids, you're not getting in my will. Who agrees? That's stupid. Right? This is dumb. That's who we are. Why would we expect good from God when we reject his son? Who was the son? He's the heir. And they took him and killed him and cast him out of the garden, out of the vineyard. What shall, for, what shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandmen and will give the vineyard unto others. And have you not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. What is he saying? The stone that the builders, those prophets that you rejected, the prophets that rejected, you know, those, when, when, the, when they come, you rejected the prophets. Now when he comes, the people reject. There's this Old Testament verse that Jesus is quoting here that says, hey, guess what, guys? You're in the Bible. <laughs> I'm the chief cornerstone, and you're coming and rejecting me. That's what he's saying. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. You remember that? What did they do? Verse 12. And they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people. Listen, think about that story. You get it? He's telling them the story, and they perceive we're like the people beating the prophets, and we're like the, you're claiming to be the son of, the son of, the, of God, and you're saying that we're like the people that are killing people, trying to get onto the will, and that makes us so mad that you made us a part of that. We want to kill you. They're fulfilling the prophecy because they're mad about, who thinks that's stupid? Right. They're going right into it. Sin makes you stupid. For they knew that he had spoken a parable against them, and they left and went their way. What was Jesus claiming to be in that parable? He was claiming to be the Son of God and the heir to all that God is and all that God has. Jesus is the heir. Jesus is predicted to inherit all things. In, in Revelation 5, a great throng worships Jesus Christ because he is worthy to open the scrolls. There's all these scrolls. Who's worthy to open the scroll? And it's the Son this Revelation 5 is about the Lord Jesus Christ. In this passage, there's a book. The book is written on the inside and on the outside. It's sealed with seven seals. This passage about the book of, in Revelation 5 comes after the fourth chapter where you have mag a magnificent a song praising God for his creation. We know that sin entered in and marred God's creation. But when Jesus, the Lamb of God, came, shed his blood at the, cow at the cross of Calvary, he not only made provision for the forgiveness of our sins, but the Lord Jesus Christ purchased back unto himself a ruined and a marred universe. So they began to look. Who is worthy to open the seals? The seven-sealed book represented the title deed to the universe. Who's worthy to open this book? And no one was found worthy. Then there was a declaration that was made. Behold the Lamb who's worthy to open the book. The Lamb is worthy to open the seals. And so they go through and they open all the seals. They get to chapter 11 and it says this about Christ at the very end. The seal tr ju judgments go, the trumpet judgments go. Verse 15, and the seventh angel, Reve Revelation eleven fifteen, 15, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, this is yet future, this is what they're going to sing one day about Jesus. Do you hear it? You want to know it? Verse 15, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. 
and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever. You have to almost do it in rhythm, don't you? And he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God in their seats fell on their faces and worshiped God. Jesus Christ is the heir of all things. What is amazing is that we're told that when we come to know Christ, we become joint heirs with him. Romans 8, 16 says this, the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. If you're saved, you're a child of God. That's what it means to be born again, to be born from above. You are born into God's family. Everything belongs to Jesus. And when we become a child of God, Jesus Christ is our older brother. And Romans 8, 16 says, verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. That does not mean that we are equal with Jesus, but we're co-heirs with Jesus. Those who are in Christ are joint heirs with Christ. The down payment of that inheritance is the Spirit of God himself that seals us unto the day of redemption. Jesus Christ is greater because, first of all, he's the heir of all things. Here's the next magnificent term to help us understand that Jesus is greater. Are you ready? Number two, creator. Creator. It says, by whom also he made the worlds. Hath in these last days, God hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. There is more than enough evidence to prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is a person of history. Uh, On this point, anyone who studies history seriously agrees. No one can make a cogent argument that there was no such historical figure as Jesus. There's also more than enough evidence to prove that he rose from the dead. Again, people deny this historical fact, but when they do, they deny it by ignoring the evidence or listening to someone who denies the evidence. Not because the evidence is not there. The Bible makes it clear that through, sorry, the Bible makes it clear though that Jesus' coming in these last days was not his beginning. Let me say that again. Jesus' coming in these last days was not his beginning. He existed before his incarnation. At Christmas time, we, we, we celebrate the fact that God became flesh and dwelt among us. But he existed before he became a baby in Bethlehem. He pre-existed. He pre-existed creation itself because the Bible teaches clearly that Jesus himself was active in creation. Here it is stated that God the Father Father not only revealed himself through Jesus Christ and made him heir of all things, but also that it was this same Jesus that made the worlds. The word worlds translated here is aeonis, or ages, the eons. He made them. He made the ages. He is the originator. He is the sustainer of all things. What a concept when you begin to think about this universe of ours and all that, about how all of it came to existence. Many today want to tell us that everything came from nothing. I don't believe that everything came from nothing. I, I believe that everything came from someone. That someone is Jesus Christ. If there's design, there's a designer. There's a painting, there's a painter. Here's some verses that tell us that Jesus created all things. Not only Hebrews 1, 2, that he created the whole world. Genesis 1, 26 says this. And God said, let us. Is God singular? And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over cattle cattle over all the earth over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth so god created man in his own image in the image of god created he him male and female created he them you have us and our and he and him 
Why do you have plural and singular? It's because God is one, but he exists in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. John 1.1 1, 1 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Who is Him? The Word. Who's the Word? Well, later on it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who created the world? Jesus did. God did. The Spirit did. All things were made by him. Colossians 1.14. This is an amazing verse. Are you ready? In whom we have redemption through his blood. Talking about Jesus. Who do we have redemption in? Who's the person that we have redemption in his blood through? Who is that? It's Jesus. Okay, verse 14, Colossians 1, it's up here. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over every creature, for by him we're all, for by who? The the one that redeemed us by his blood. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him, he's the creator, and for him, he's the heir. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist or are held together. You'll see that in a minute. By him were all things created, for him were all things created, he's holding it all together. Jesus Christ created the whole world. He made something out of nothing. He brought new life where there was none. He can do the same thing for you today. He can bring life where there is no life. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He's the heir. He's the creator. He wants you to have new life. Here's number three. Don't get worried. I got seven. Here we go, number three, radiance, radiance. It says here, who being the brightness of his glory. We're just taking it phrase by phrase. Jesus is the heir. He is the creator. Here it says he's the brightness of his glory. That is the radiance of God's glory. Radiance means to shine forth. He is saying that Jesus Christ is the radiance of, of God's glory. You know, there's a difference between the light of the moon and the light of the sun. The moon reflects light. When the astronauts went to the moon, it was discovered that all the dust they were kicking around was made of, at least in part, titanium. And titanium is a perfect reflector. It's used on movie screens at one time, and the moon is covered with it. See, because the moon does not generate light, the moon reflects light. But the sun is different. The sun does not reflect light. The sun radiates light. It is the very essence and the nature of the sun to give forth light. This verse says that Jesus Christ is the radiance of God's glory. He's not reflecting glory from God the Father. He is radiating the glory of God. It's coming from him. He's the source. Just like God is the source and the Holy Spirit is the source. Do you get it? He's the radiance of God's glory. This means that Jesus Christ is the perfect uh, radiance and reflection of the glory of God. The Apostle Paul was on the road to Damascus. He had made up his mind he was going to stamp out the Christian faith. He, went, he thought they, they were a bunch of heretics and a bunch of crazies. And the Bible says about the noonday on that Damascus road that Paul saw a light, it says, above the brightness of the sun. He was smitten into the dust with conviction. And he said, who art thou, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, right? Above, and it says here, above the brightness of the sun. 2 Corinthians 6 says it this way. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. You remember when Jesus went up onto the Mount of Transfiguration? We talked about it last week. 
and a little bit of his humanity was pulled back, and what does it say? He was transfigured before him. He's the radiance of God's glory. We're moving quick. Number four, fourth term is image. It says here, and the express image of his person. Jesus is the image of God's person. The term ex- translated here, ex- express image, is used, used only here in the New Testament. In extra biblical literature, it was, it was used for engraving on wood and etching in a metal, a brand on an animal hide, an impression in the clay, or a stamped image on coins. Pers- person is a word conveying nature, being, or essence. The sun is the talking about the sun, S O N, is the perfect imprint, the exact representation of the nature and essence of God in time and space. I'm giving you a lot this morning. Can you handle it? Here we go. In Colossians 1.14, he says, we've already read this, in whom we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. By describing Jesus in this manner, Paul emphasizes that he is both the representation and the manifestation of God. Thus, he is fully God in every way. Jesus is God. In John's gospel, Jesus told the disciples that he was the way, the truth, and the life. You guys remember that? No man comes to the Father but by me, he says. But then he says in verse 7, if you had known me, let's just read it, verse 6. Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. He says in another place, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's the image of the invisible God. God who had times past spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, have his, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Notice the interaction that happened with Philip after this verse, verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth, sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long with you, and you have not know me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Jesus is the express image of the Father. He is the express image of God. He's the heir. He is the creator. He is the radiance. He is the image number four. He is sustainer. He is sustainer. Let's take a run up to it. Hebrews 1.3, who being the brightness of his glory, that's radiance, the express image of his person, that's image, and upholding all things by the word of his power, that's sustainer. Upholding here is an interesting word. It means to support or to carry. It implies stability, and it also suggests mobility and movement. Support and movement. Now there's a similar statement back in Colossians. Again, back to Colossians 1.17. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist or are held together. I read this this week. It's pretty cool. One of the mysteries in physics is what keeps an atom together. The neutrons in an atom are all positively charged, and so it should tear apart. Physicists don't understand what keeps it all together. Now, I'm no physicist, but I know what keeps it all together. By him, all things hold together. He has it all in his hands. He's holding it all together. By him, all things consist. One of these deep days, Jesus is taking his hands off, and when he does, the Bible says this universe is going to come apart. What happens when atoms come apart? The Bible says that this earth is going to melt with a fervent heat. Maybe all that takes for that to happen is just for Jesus to let it go. God is going to reach in and take all of the that defiles, all that sin, all the sins out of it, and He's going to put it all back together, brand new, in a new heaven and a new earth. It, it'll be so great and so beautiful. We'll even forget possibly what this one looked like. It says He's upholding, He is supporting all things. He's holding all things together. What does it say? He's doing it. Verse 3, by the word of his power. Jesus spoke a word and the world came into existence. By his word, 
Not only did it come into existence, now it's, everything is being held together by his word. The Bible says, of him and through him and to him are all things. He started it all, he sustains it all, and when it all gets done, Jesus Christ is going to be right there to wrap it up. And let me tell you this, if the Lord Jesus Christ can do that with creation, whatever burden you're bearing, whatever problem you brought with you today, don't you think Jesus can hold you up and support you and carry you through? Jesus is big enough to take care of your problems. If you follow him, you're going to make it. You may not think you are. If you're born again, if you're a child of God, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. God has a destiny for your life. He knows exactly what you're going through right now. You're going to make it. Be encouraged. Seven statements about Christ. He's an heir. He's creator. He's a radiance. He's the image. He's the sustainer. Number six, he's the purifier. He's the purifier. Do you see it there in the verse? who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself, what's the word? Purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The tense of this verb purged is a tense that means something that happened at a point in time. Something that happened at one point that never needs to be repeated again. The writer, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has carried us now all the way from creation to Calvary. Now he shows us this eternal Christ, who is creator, who is the radiance, who is the image of God. Now we see that he is the redeemer, the savior by who himself, who, on, who by himself on Calvary's cross made purification for our sins. Jesus died on the cross to cleanse us from sin. Jesus Christ died and became the, surf, uh, the, the uh, sacrifice to purge us from our sins. Man, think about that term, our sins. Think about all of the pain and suffering that has come from our sins. Anybody hear a, a story in the last month? I, I'm not talking about a particular one, but I'm just talking about a story where when you kind of sift it all down, sin destroyed someone. Have you heard a story like that? We hear it all the time. Sometimes we just, they come to us in news stories and in articles and in something whispered to us by a friend. Sin is devastating. God hates it. And he loved you and I so much that he knew that if he didn't forgive us of our sins, that we could not be with him, that we couldn't be made right with him, that we would be suffering forever, separated from him, the creator and the sustainer. But he also is so holy that he couldn't let that sin go. And so what he did was he sacrificed himself. He, he purged our sins by becoming the wrath-bearing sacrifice on the cross. Who killed Jesus? I did. And so did you. Why did he die? So that our sins could be purged. So that we could be clean. Whatever those sins were, whatsoever those sins are that you've committed, those sins that you are committing right now, Jesus Christ died for when he died on the cross. It says here that he, by himself, it was just him up there on that cross. He, by himself, paid the price. He made purification. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. In Revelation 1, 5, it says, Unto him who loved us and washed us once and forever from our sin in his own blood. Ours were the sins, his was the blood. He purged us and made purification by himself for our sins. He's the heir, 
He's creator. He's radiance. He's image. He's sustainer. He's purifier. Here's one of my favorite ones. Last one, number seven. He's seated. He's seated. who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, when he completed that work of salvation, nothing more to be done to pay for our sins, he sat down. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. In the Old Testament, the tabernacle had seven articles of of furniture. And in that, in that tabernacle, the priests were, among other things, basically butchers. That, I mean, when you, if you were to watch what they actually did, they were taking animals, slaying animals, slaying their blood, sacrificing them all day long. And the reason they had to do that is because The blood had to atone for sin. And they had all these things they had to do to atone for their own sin as priests. We're going to talk about this more in the book of Hebrews. They had things they had to do to atone for their own sins so that then they could represent the people to atone for the people's sins. And of course, you know that we don't ever stop sinning. So, So once you do the sacrifice of the sheep, or the goat, or the turtle dove, or whatever, they have to keep sacrificing, and then of course, that, that doesn't work for the next day, or the next day, they just have to keep sacrificing and sacrificing, and as a result in the tabernacle, all the different furniture that's there to, to worship God with, to do that with, there's no place to sit down, because the work of redemption, the work of purging the sin by the sacrifice of an animal, had to keep happening over and over and over again. There are seven articles on fur, of furniture, but there was one article of furniture you would not find in it, and that was a chair. No place to sit down. In Hebrews 10, verse 11 and 13, it tells us why. It says, And every priest stands daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Then it says this, but this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever. Not multiple sacrifices day after day after day after day. It was one sacrifice for all sins, forever. What does it say he did? He sat down on the right hand of God. You know what that means? The blood that was needed to pay for your sin has already been spilled. And if you know Christ as your Savior, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There doesn't have to be another sacrifice for sin. All there has to be is a recognition of Jesus' sacrifice for sin. Why? Because he's not just any old guy. He's not just another being. He's the heir of all things. He's the creator. He's the radiance of God's glory. He is the express image of the person of God. To see him is to see the Father. He is the sustainer of the universe. Not only did he make it, he sustains it. He purified our sins. And when he had done that once for all, he sat down. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Jesus is the glory. At, Jesus is in the glory at the right hand of the Father. He came all the way from the bosom of the Father to the bosom of a mother. In infancy, he startled the king. In boyhood, he confounded the scholars. In manhood, he ruled nature. On the cross, he conquered sin. In the tomb and the resurrection, he conquered death. He's the Lord of history. He's the God of eternity. Jesus is greater. And now he sits down on the right hand of of the Father. So the issue today is this. What are you going to do with Jesus? Is he the Lord of your life? Has there been a time in your life where you recognized your own sin and recognized what Jesus did and put your faith and trust in him? 
There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby ye must be saved. Jesus is greater. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? How many of you say, Pastor Ben, there was a time in my life where I understood who Jesus